Good morning to those in the United States and good afternoon to those who are joining us from Europe and North Africa. My name is Tess Davis and I'm Executive Director of the Antiquities Coalition. It's my honor to open this virtual event on the digitization of privately held materials in the Maghreb. Today's discussion is part of a larger ongoing cultural preservation initiative between the Antiquities Coalition and the US Department of State, the Algerian Ministry of Culture and Arts and the Metropolitan New York Library Council. Through this effort, American and Algerian colleagues are working together to organize and implement a strategy to protect the country's rich cultural heritage, which is being targeted by thieves and traffickers for sale on the global black market. These criminals have not spared the important archaeological objects, archival materials, rare manuscripts, and intangible heritage that are held in family or private collections. And the work of archaeologists and law enforcement have demonstrated that some of these looted and stolen pieces are being marketed to unsuspecting collectors in the United States, the world's largest art market, both licit and unfortunately illicit. For that reason, we're especially grateful to our sponsors at the U.S. Embassy in Algiers and the State Department who are supporting this work as well as so many other important efforts throughout the region and world. We're deeply grateful for their leadership and we are likewise grateful for the leadership of our Algerian partners in the ministry. A few notes about technology. This presentation is being recorded and the recording will be made available after its conclusion. For simultaneous interpretation, please click the button at the bottom of the navigation bar on your screen that says interpretation and select your language. To ask a question, use the Q&A or chat function also located on the navigation bar, and we hope to get as, to as many questions as possible. Through our work to date, including closed door virtual meetings of our international working group, we've learned firsthand the great progress being made across the region on digitization and documentation of cultural heritage materials. Today, we continue to follow that theme and dig deeper with a focus on the digitization of manuscripts, particularly privately held materials, featuring a keynote presentation followed by a moderated panel discussion. And we have quite a treat for all of us with our keynote speaker. It's now my distinct honor to introduce Father Columbus Stewart, the Executive Director of the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library. In his role as Himmel Executive Director, Father Columbus travels extensively throughout the Middle East, Africa, Eastern Europe, and South Asia, cultivating relationships with communities possessing manuscript collections from the early medieval to the early modern periods. Under his leadership, Himmel's manuscript preservation projects have increased from one project in Lebanon to those located in more than a dozen countries around the world. And during this time, Himmel has photographed tens of thousands of manuscripts in many of the world's most dangerous and difficult to reach places, giving priority to preserving the manuscript collections of persecuted and endangered minorities. Hemmel was awarded the 2011 National Medal of Honor from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the highest award a library can receive in the United States. And Father Columbo was also named by the National Endowment for the Humanities as the 2019 Jefferson Lecturer in the Humanities, the highest honor the US federal government confers for distinguished intellectual achievement in the field. Today, we will hear about preservation from Father Columbo and more about his work and then turn to Abdelhamid Salah, the director of the Egyptian Heritage Rescue Fund. Father Columbo will discuss the lessons learned from years of experience with digitization and manuscripts. I turn it now to Father Columbo. Thank you for joining us. You. My focus today will be on private libraries. Some of them are families, some of them belong to religious institutions. So these are non-state, non governmental libraries. And so the question arises, why would they prefer to work with an NGO like Himmel, the Home Museum and Manuscript Library, rather than with some other type of organization? For example, a, a national project or a government library or archive. The primary reason, of course, is that they wish to keep their manuscripts with the family or the religious institution or whatever else it is, rather than giving them to a state or other institution. So there's the desire to maintain the family or institutional heritage. Sometimes they also prefer to have a very personal relationship with the digitization partner. And so a large part of the work that I do 
is building these relationships with prospective partners so that we establish trust, mutual respect, and then can work effectively together. And in some cases, and this would be very much the case with the Palestinian libraries in East Jerusalem, they belong to a religious or a cultural minority that is distrustful of government organizations. Obviously the situation in Jerusalem, we have found the same working with Muslim communities in India who are worried because of the current policies of the government and they as a religious minority in that country want to make sure that their manuscripts are safely digitized. Now, for those of you who approach these things from a kind of national perspective, I think it's important to realize that in the digital era, the actual physical location of a manuscript becomes less important if it has been digitized. So we can have virtual online repositories that have many libraries in them so that no longer do we have to put everything in one single physical location, but they can be gathered together in virtual repositories. And while you might think that having all of these smaller libraries all over the place, that it makes them more vulnerable, that is true individually. However, as we have learned in some locations, sadly, where central repositories, central libraries, central archives have been destroyed by things like war or fire, there is also an advantage of having important historic materials in more than one location. So some of the issues that arise in working with private libraries are the fact that there needs to be a trusted intermediary. Uh, in other words, our organization always works with people who come from those places or cultures to make an introduction, to facilitate the relationship, to avoid misunderstanding, uh, because we are a foreign NGO and we have to ensure that people understand fully what our motivations are and that we are a trustworthy partner. We've been doing this since 1965, so more than 50 years. So we have demonstrated that we can be safe and effective as colleagues. It also requires that a member of the family or the institution particularly be interested in their manuscript heritage and its protection. In other words, an internal advocate. And then finally, for working with us, because our funding comes from foundations, uh, grants of various kinds, the family or private institution must be willing to make their manuscript heritage available online with certain conditions, reserving publication rights and so on um, to themselves, but allowing them to be online for access by scholars around the world. So those are the basic issues that we face. And so now I'll give you those two examples of the work that we have done. Our first major projects with Islamic manuscripts were in the old city of East Jerusalem. And there you see one of the gates, Bab al-Nadr going on to the Rama Sharif. And we worked with the Buderi family library, which is right before the entrance onto the Haram. And there we were able to establish a studio and this is our standard procedure. We provide the equipment, the training, technical supervision, and payment for the work that is being done. In this case, by Shaima Budeiri, a member of the family who is passionate about their manuscripts. So that studio out the window has this view. So you see it's immediately adjacent to the Harama Sharif. So this is a potentially vulnerable location because of the conflict around this holy place. Um, and thus it made it very important that the manuscripts be digitized for protection. We've worked also in Jerusalem with the Khalidi family, a very historic family, again, like the Buderis with a tradition of learning and a significant manuscript collection. And there you see uh, members of the family 
along with our field director, a Palestinian Christian, Daoud Dattal, and there I am as well, as we do the kind of relationship building necessary to do the work. I'm very happy to say that these projects in Jerusalem are finished and the manuscripts are now uh, available on our website. And I will show you that in just a moment. Our largest current project is actually in Mali. And all of you know the story of the manuscripts of Timbuktu. And you also know the connections between Timbuktu and the Maghreb with these historic relationships uh, between uh, the regions. You all know the story of the evacuation of manuscripts from Timbuktu in 2012, uh, just before the invasion and conquest of Timbuktu and its occupation. So many of the manuscripts were taken to Bamako in these metal boxes, uh, going down the river Niger and then by land to Bamako. And you also know, many of you personally, uh, the rescuer, Dr. Abdelkader Haidara. We have been working with Dr. Haidara and Savama, his organization, since 2013 to organize the digitization of the manuscripts taken from Timbuktu. And here you see the studio in Bamako, which is uh, very active with multiple cameras. And we do this work as always, thanks to our funders. There were also libraries in Timbuktu that never left. And so we have also had projects in Timbuktu with the three libraries associated with the three principal mosques, the Jingerber, the Sankore, and the city Yaha. And so there, as always, we formed local teams, we provided them the training and the payment, and of course, visiting regularly during the project so that we can make sure everybody's happy, things are going well, we're resolving any technical issues and so on. Again, the personal contact. We have a new project in Jenne, which all of you know from its magnificent mosque and is sometimes called the sister city, really in some ways the rival city of Timbuktu with its own manuscript tradition and focus on Islamic learning. In Jenne, manuscripts are brought in by families and they are deposited in a central library. And so you find a kind of plastic carry bag like this full of a family's manuscripts. They are then organized, uh, they are cleaned, they are digitized, and either they remain in the library in Jenne or they go back to the family. But there are digital copies that have been made. So when all of these photographs are taken, they come back to our place. This is in Minnesota, in the United States, uh, in the northern Midwest of the United States near Canada. Very beautiful location in the summer, very cold in the winter. And there we have a university and uh, a school, a lycée, publishing house and the monastery. And it is there that we do the work of archiving the data so that the data is always safe, the images will be migrated to new technology and so on. The manuscripts are also cataloged and we have catalogers all over the world working virtually on the project, uh, including people from uh, West Africa working on those manuscripts and similarly from Egypt and the Near East working on their own manuscript heritage. All of this goes online in the HMML or Himmel reading room, which you can see here, so that scholars can read the manuscripts, check the cataloging information and so on. And one of the things we've learned in our work is that manuscripts can disappear. As Tess Davis was just telling us, things can be stolen, they can go on the black market, they can leave their country of origin. And we have found this to be the case with manuscripts we photographed in Ethiopia, and more recently in countries where there has been conflict, such as Syria and Iraq. Manuscripts relocated, missing, in some cases, sadly, completely destroyed. So the result of this work, um, the digitization efforts by Himmel and our partners in Ethiopia, East Jerusalem, India, Pakistan, and then in Mali has been substantial. Many, many, many manuscripts from very interesting and distinctive Islamic cultures 
joining the many, many, many manuscripts from Eastern Christian, Western Christian traditions. So it's a wonderful resource for the study of manuscripts that remain in their original location, but now are available for others to read. So I encourage you to find more information on our websites, himmel.org, vhimmel.org for the online access. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Father Columba, for both your remarks, but more importantly, for the work that you and Hemel and your partners are doing in Mali and around the world. In order to dig a bit deeper into that, I'll now invite to the conversation Abdelhamid Salah, the director of the Egyptian Heritage Rescue Fund and an expert in preservation and conservation. And he'll be leading a quick Q&A with Father Columba. Um, Abdelhamid, we turn to you now. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear Tess. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Father Columbia, for your great presentation, your great work. I feel so impressed, actually, about all your support to, to digitize and comment the manuscripts in different countries. Thank you. So let me start with this question. Through the, your great, through the strength of violent in uh, becoming less and less in this area, do you think that, or do you describe manuscripts in Mali and in Maghrib still under threat, and are these manuscripts exposed to different kinds of hazards? Yes, very much. So I, I told you the beginnings of our work were in Europe uh, mm -hmm. during the time when they were afraid of a World War III. Then we began the work in the Near East in 2003, which is, of course, the time of the American invasion of Iraq. Then you have the Arab Spring, you have the civil war in Syria, you have the rise of Daesh in Iraq. And so many of these things uh, happened suddenly, like in Timbuktu. No one predicted there would be this sudden attack. Uh, but we have also had experiences of working in places where after we had microfilmed or digitized the manuscripts, there was a fire. So there are these perennial constant threats and all of you working in libraries and archives are well aware of problems like fire, insects, dust, the other threats, in addition to the more violent ones. So I would say that important libraries and archives are always, always in some kind of danger. And so we have to do what we can to mitigate the risk and keep them safe. And digitization is one aspect of that work. Thank you. According to what you present, and also according to uh, our uh, research in uh, manuscripts and the different conditions that are exposed and are affecting manuscripts in different countries, we know that there is no doubt that conditions are different from Maghreb than in Mali. And in that regard, and from, of course, from your very long experience working with manuscripts, according across the Middle East, North Africa, all over the world. Can you please identify any themes for us that we should pay more attention to in our current preservation work and we have to take care about these themes in our future plans? So I think one of the most important things, and all of you know this, is having trainings. So mm -hmm. providing trainings to people who belong to these private libraries or these other institutions, which are not necessarily a national library or national archive. And this does so many things. It, it helps them understand what they must do to take care of their own family heritage. It establishes a kind of network of people interested in this work across a country or across a region, like we're doing here today. This is a, this is a great example of, of what can be done with that kind of thing. And even the smallest training can make a real difference. So I think that's the most important thing. And then also being able to connect libraries and archives with partners. So uh, we're always happy to find new partners. If any of you are interested in working with us or know people who would be interested, please tell me. I'll put my email in the chat. Um, there are also organizations that do manuscript conservation and this kind of work. And so I think if we all work together, we can make sure that everything will be as safe as possible. 
Thank you. But you mentioned the first thing, it's about to deliver training for our colleagues working in manuscript. What do you, how, do you, how do you think, in your opinion, how we can make this knowledge sustainable to next generation and how we can support them as much as we can in order to not just to train them well, but actually support them to apply the knowledge gained through this training on ground? Well, th this is a challenge because they, they need to have a way to make a living. Mm -hmm. So it's not simply enough to train them. If they're going to use their training, they need a job. So they need a position with an institution or they need some source of funding. We can do that temporarily during the digitization work, but they need something sustainable. And so that requires the family library or institution organization library to become sustainable, to develop itself as an organization, to identify sources of funding, um, and to find ways that they themselves can become a center of learning and a center of culture to be sustainable. Or perhaps they form a partnership with another private library because then together they can be more sustainable uh, more easily than separately. More into that a bit, and also how our private collection different from collections that held by government, and what, in your opinion, think that private owners want to do, and what are their objectives, according to your experience for dealing with this different kind of collections, family or government. The family collections are very interesting because they they form a single collection. And mm -hmm. so you see the interest in the history of the family itself. So they, for example, in Jerusalem, the Hali family, the Budevi family, there was somebody in the family who was a great scholar. And it is this person who gathered the manuscripts and created a personal library. And this is very interesting because it tells you about culture in a particular location. So a national library can have many wonderful things, but it does not have personality in the same way that a private library has. And so uh, preserving that personality, that distinctive identity, I think is important. And this is what the families want as well. They want to honor their ancestor who collected the manuscripts they want to honor the people who took care of the manuscripts over many generations. And uh, it's a matter of pride, pride in their family, pride in their heritage, pride in their learning. Um, but at the same time, establishing the network with other <laughs> libraries, including national ones, is very, very important so that they find the support and training they need. I understand exactly what you are uh, saying because it's we have a lot of experience here in Egypt according to this. Let's change a little bit and in the last years we show a lot of maps that show the effect of climate change and how it's really extremely impact on Africa here. So how much do you worry about climate change? Uh, I worry a lot, um, both because of my own country where we <laughs> see the impact of climate change and of course, we're all very aware of the situation in the Maghreb and the Sahel with, uh, with the potential for desertification and, and the, the real threat to human existence. So climate change is one of many stresses on communities. Obviously, cultural heritage is threatened by climate change like everything else. My worry and concern is that cultural heritage, as people are fighting to survive, cultural heritage will be one of the things that they put aside because they have to feed themselves. They have to support their families. And so we need to do what we can now to mm -hmm. make sure that all of these aspects of human existence will be protected because we do not know what the future will bring. I agree with you. I totally agree with you. Uh, Mr. Father Komba, you know that I do many preservation and disaster risk management and first aid for cultural heritage training here in Egypt, in the region, and also in many other countries in the world. So do you think that there is a single priority that you would you suggest for our audience as the most important they can take to look after their manuscript and other cultural treasure? 
it's very simple. Make a list, make an inventory of what you have. It is very surprising to us how many libraries, even institutions, do not have a good inventory of their own manuscripts. This is very important in case of loss, theft, or destruction. And then the second thing is to do the digitizing. And there are many ways to do it. I think it's better to partner with an experienced um, organization like ours, but it is possible to do it yourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you have the problem of archiving data and, and so on. So I think those two things are very important as a kind of insurance or protection. I can understand this because uh, me and Peter and our colleague Tim, we are implementing a project to an emergency intervention for Adam Museum. And we know that our first advice for them, as you said also, have an intervention, make a list, you know, right. document your object so you can have an evidence that you, you had this kind of collections. We know that manuscripts are very fragile material and need a sensitive conditions in order to be preserved. In your opinion and through your long experience, what your main advice for both government and private sectors or people who are only uh, have uh, their own collection, the best way and advice to conserve these valuable manuscripts also in order that if they found a kind of a damage and where it's need an emergency intervention for a manuscript, what you advise also how to stabilize those manuscripts, like 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 a quick device advice for those who even don't have an idea about, but they own a collection. Well, as all of you know, the most uh, the greatest dangers to manuscripts are high humidity, so being very damp, and then insects and mold. So if you can find a way to protect the manuscript with, for example, a very simple conservation style box, you can make it yourself. Mm -hmm. you, get the, you get the cardboard, you get the training to know how to cut it. That is the, the most effective, simple, not very expensive thing you can do to protect the manuscript from outside threats. But the humidity is an issue. So if you can find a way to keep them in a very dry place, that's critical. Egypt is perfect. Egypt has the perfect climate for keeping manuscripts, but other people have rain and mm -hmm. humidity. And so they have to have other ways of doing the same. Because of climate change, we start to head by heavy rains in the last years. And I think the situation will be different in the future according to our weather. Maybe we will not be, we don't know, but also, we know that a lot of material, especially when they use it as a support to uh, handle the manuscript or to conserve the manuscript, sometimes pH degree is cause some damage. And people, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the general people, not, not researchers or scientific people or conservators. They don't know how does it affect pH, the wrong pH on the paper. Is this right. a way that they can test the pH degree for the material, especially if they would like to use a support to these manuscripts? Uh, there are many very simple techniques that can be used to protect them. This again is the training. And to make sure that every library has a basic set of tools and practices. It's not complicated, but it is very important that people have this basic information. And I know many of you are working on this uh, even now. Great. Well, thank you very so much for that fascinating conversation. And we just wanted to open it up now to our full panel of experts, um, which includes from Algeria, Mr. Ahmed Belalem, Director of the Center for Manuscript Studies in Adrar, and Professor Ahmed Jafari, Director of the Laboratory of Algerian Manuscripts in Africa. From Libya, Mr. Abdul, Abul Kasim Bash. Bashir Kasim, director of the Gadame Society for Heritage and Manuscripts. And from Morocco, Mr. Jamal Baida, 
National Archivist. And this discussion with all of our participants today will be moderated by Dr. Charles Henry, President of the Council on Library and Information Resources. And Dr. Henry has served as CLEAR President since 2007, after having served for a decade as a university librarian at Rice University. And his work focuses on a variety of topics, including the evolution of humanities in a digital era, the organization and information and support of its teaching and research, the concept of the library, and the idea of coherence at scale for higher education in the United States and indeed around the world. And more recently, he has been working with partners internationally on a truly global digital library. And Dr. Henry and the Antiquities Coalition are very close partners. We have are the founding organizations behind the Digital Library of the Middle East, um, the project that instigated our active involvement in the digitization and documentation of cultural heritage materials in North Africa and the Middle East. Um, so Dr. Henry and my AC friend and co-founder Peter Herdrick initiated and developed this project and its platform with funding from the Andrew Mellon and the Whiting Foundations. And Dr. Henry, I turn it over to you now for a discussion with all of our great participants today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tess. Thank you for that eloquent um, introduction. Um, being cognizant of time, what I'd like to do is to ask a question of each of our panelists, and the question will give them an opportunity to briefly describe their work and uh, their interests to introduce them uh, to our audience, and then uh, with, with time, um, talk, uh, ask some general questions about issues and themes and perhaps challenges that uh, all of them uh, confront. So I would like to first ask Professor Ahmed Jafri, who test, uh, acknowledges works at the Laboratory of Algerian Manuscripts in the University of Adrar in Algeria. Uh, Professor Ahmed, could you talk a little bit about your work with manuscripts and how you assess the current state of preservation? First, hello to everyone. I'd like first to thank uh, all the union of uh, the heritage, American heritage uh, for having launched this project of digitization and for this meeting concerning the protection of the family materials. Concerning the protection and the digitization of the heritage, this work that the Cent National Center is making, which is a cultural uh, uh, institution uh, to protect uh, the heritage with uh, scientific tools. Uh, if we talk about this center, uh, the, um, I manage uh, uh, these items. Uh, I would like to talk uh, as a specialist uh, before being director of the Center uh, of Protection of uh, Heritage, I had some projects. I have uh, uh, much ideas uh, uh, concerning the protection of uh, this kind of archives. Uh, this center, as uh, the law uh, is saying, has a target of protecting uh, all the archives and selecting them, protecting them, uh, making a scientific study uh, of these archives um, by specialists um, and uh, uh, bringing uh, under the light the scientists uh, who are working on this protection uh, protecting the all what is uh, manuscripts and showing all the ideas, uh, genius ideas uh, that has become from this protection and make people aware about the protection of these manuscripts and how to protect them as a cultural elements and make uh, the most important uh, contracts with the national institutions and international institutions. This center, since uh, uh, his creation, has taken in charge the training of uh, the people, the, the themes working then, each one in his uh, speciali speciality. 
and they started working on the field in all the Algerian territory, and this started from Adrar being uh, the uh, center of the work and that has a lot of manuscripts. And then we went to Tamnras Tinduk Bashar, and after two connects, uh, the National Center uh, has made two centers in Biskra and Tilimsan, uh, where we had to start an inventory uh, in the east and the west of Algeria. Since the start, the this launching of this center, we had more than ten thousand of manuscripts uh, in one hundred and twenty uh, uh, places, and then we had uh, three centers of conservation, and the uh, work is still going on. And then we will continue to talk about. Uh, uh, this uh, question of family materials, uh, if you want to ask other questions, I'm open to your questions. Because in my presentation, I'm talking about the most important challenges that we had uh, 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 concerning the family materials. Uh, do you hear me? Can I continue or should I answer to any of your questions? Uh, oh, thank you very much for for that uh, gracious introduction to your to your work and your interests. Uh, for clarification, it was uh, that was uh, Mr. Ahmed Balalem, uh, who is the director of the Center for Manuscript Studies in Algeria. Um, I think if we could, uh, Professor Ahmed Jaffrey, uh, could we come back to you for a similar question? Um, to talk about your work with manuscripts and also how you uh, assess the current state of preservation. Please. I have a small presentation on the family materials and the challenges that we faced on the family materials. Can I present it? Uh, do I have time to present it? Um, if, Can I if present it, is, it? If it is a short, if it is short and and uh, respects the time that we need to allocate to your other panelists, yes. So through the activ different activities of the center during these years uh, and the uh, visits of the fields, we faced some challenges. Uh, the most important of them, uh, the non-answer of uh, the one who possesses uh, these archives. Uh, uh, consider them that it is a personal uh, thing. And uh, the possessors, uh, refused to talk about the subject, the subject of the uh, the inventory. The, the, you, you can find the people who have uh, these manuscripts, but they don't want to talk with us. And each one of uh, the village uh, direct you to another person, and then a person to another person. And some of them are seeing these archives like something which is holy, and that you can't see them. And even uh, those who have the archives, uh, if you talk about uh, digitization, they don't talk to you about other uh, manuscripts, they hide them. And sometimes uh, they are not responding to this because they have uh, negative experiences with some persons. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, archives had been lost. Uh, some of the researchers uh, who came to these 
persons, they didn't give them back to, to study them, they didn't give them back to the processors. So they let a negative impact. And these processors don't want to deal with the, uh, other persons. So uh, sometimes uh, the processor doesn't have enough money uh, to invest on the, the protection of these uh, archives. And sometimes it's not, the, uh, these processors are asking for uh, money, money, uh, so they can preserve their possession. And this is illegal. Sometimes uh, uh, these kind of uh, contacts needs a lot of time and the possessor uh, doesn't have time to receive the technical team for 10 days. And one of the most important challenges is that the possessor that has this archive from his grandparents uh, can't have enough uh, knowledge about the objects. Uh, or uh, the persons who uh, made this archives, uh, this object. So uh, these people uh, doesn't have any uh, cultural background. And sometimes you can find that uh, 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 the objects has been distributed uh, for heritage and they had uh, a lot of uh, objects uh, and after the heritage from the grandfather this object has been given and each one from the village uh, is uh, possessing one or two or three objects the one that has uh, two or three uh, manuscripts uh, hide them in a secured place and uh, uh, this person doesn't want to show them to public. Uh, in general, these are the most important challenges uh, that are facing uh, people working in the field. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Professor. Um, that, that was a, a wonderful, enlightening, and uh, um, educative uh, presentation. Uh, on both, I think, the opportunities and the challenges of, of the excellent work that you were doing. Um, I'd like to turn to our other two panelists and give them also an opportunity to talk a bit about their interests in their work. Um, another person with uh, great firsthand knowledge uh, of manuscripts from the Maghreb region is uh, Mr. Abu Qasim Bashir Qasim, who is director of the Gadames Manuscript Society in, in Libya. Uh, you focus on uh, local manuscripts related to, to trans-Saharan trade. Could you tell us a bit about your society and the digitization that you do? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for this meeting. And now I wish that we will uh, take advantage of this meeting. I present myself, uh, Abul Qasim Bashir. Uh, some, uh, uh, this is the first uh, uh, association that has been uh, held from since 2012, and we are waiting for uh, the uh, support. What happened in Libya before uh, is that the manuscript has been burned before. And most of people that has these manuscripts hide, hide them. After 17 February, uh, we knew that we can protect these uh, manuscripts and 
uh, so we uh, charged three person to make people aware how to protect these objects. In Rdemis, uh, we uh, differ from uh, the manuscript and the documents. The manuscripts are uh, books. Uh, uh, Mr. Bashir Yusha uh, made a book where he made uh 407 manuscripts and we are working and following his way uh the manuscript in Gdemis in uh, medicine and geography in arabic language and uh, quran and uh, other fields like uh, stories um, and poems and we are considering them as uh, manuscripts in Rdemis and out of Rdemis, they are protected there. Rdemis were linked to Mali, uh, to Nigeria, Tombuktu, and all, uh, a lot of African con countries. And we have the documents. Uh, in Rdemis, we have more than 3,000 uh books uh, uh, we don't have enough money so we can pay people that are working on uh, uh, on this and they are uh, helping as they can and we have the manuscripts and the documents that we have is more than 20,000 uh, documents. I have more than 2,000 myself. So these documents has been divided in different uh, uh, sections. In internet, we uh, have some documents that are linked to uh, justice and uh, we talked about uh, how to create uh, uh, companies and uh, the all what concerns the uh, uh, problems, society problems, and uh, this is for the first uh, part. And we have the second one, which is uh, the commercial documents. We have a, a huge part uh, for uh, the uh, European, uh, uh, Sari, and African uh, merchandise uh, and trade, uh, the, the trade, all what concerns the trade. We have a lot of documents and a lot much than the uh, uh, manuscripts. And we have also what we, what, what is linked to policy, uh, all what is linked to the uh, letters with the presidents and so on. And we have other documents uh, which are uh, social documents, or what happened in uh, the cities. You can find one document that talks about Tarablos, Canus, Tambuktu, uh, and Cairo, uh, all this in one letter uh, because the uh, in the commerce. Uh, people has created uh, uh, which is the letters so we have uh, all what is communicated through these letters has and we have in Gdames something which is incredible that I didn't see in any other city we have uh, a lot of problems first uh, as an association with three people they don't have enough means uh, to deal with all these documents. Libya as a country doesn't give any interest to the uh, transcriptions and all the uh, these documents. And uh, other thing is that we are suffering from the, lo the loss of uh, some documents that needs uh, protection and preservation means. Uh, people here are working with associations, but uh, some of the manuscripts, if we take three manuscripts uh, in the association, uh, we take these three in photos and then we carry on with other th three others. We don't have enough means 
uh, to pay people to come and help us because this is a big uh, work and we need someone to work and the person need to be paid and we don't have any money. And I'm, I thank you for listening and I'm ready for any question you have. Thank you very much, uh, Abu Qasim Bashir. Uh, in the interest of time, I think uh, if we have time for questions, we can take them at the end. Um, I would like to turn now to uh, our other uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Jama Baida, uh, who is the National Archivist of, of Morocco. Uh, Mr. Baida, uh, it's very good to see you. And could you talk briefly about uh, how manuscripts and archives uh, intersect or interact uh, in, in the National Archives uh, and how you approach their digitization. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me and thank you for this initiative uh, that is uh, uh, gathering the American people and uh, the Maghreb in general in Africa, and I'm very happy. I present myself uh, before anything. Jamia Baida, historian and director of Archive El Maghreb, and also uh, old president of the Maghreb Association for the Research in History. And before starting, I would like to uh, put the light on that the Archive Maghreb Association that I'm um, uh, taking in charge during 10 years is not the only one that is uh, given in the importance of all what is heritage archives and uh, we have other institutions and the most important one uh, in my mind is the National Library of the um, of Morocco and I will talk about the institution that I know very well and that I'm taking in charge during uh, 10 years. For my part uh, we have a we give importance a big importance for the general archives. Uh, the state archives uh, that has documents of the uh, national institutions, but we give also uh, a huge importance to the personal archives and the archives of families. In these archives, we found a lot, a great number of manuscripts. Uh, our plan or our strategy in this field and since 10 years is to convince uh, families, especially those uh, that has the uh, from which uh, we had uh, professors, researchers, um, doctors or family that we call in Morocco, uh, 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 families that has uh, uh, important objects. Uh, this family has a very important place in the society. So they have uh, great objects uh, as uh, manuscripts, um, documents, ordinary documents that reflects the uh, everyday life, uh, being it uh, uh, pol policy or society life. Uh, if the institution is being, uh, is having any um, power on this general uh, archives, we don't have the power on the uh, personal archives. So we are following the uh, documents of these people. We try to use the policy of convincing them. We are making, trying to work on awareness regularly through medias 
and through nets, uh, uh, through expositions that we are uh, putting in. بواسطة ندوات نقوم بحملات تحسيسية لإقناع الخوارج. Making people aware to convince them. Uh, so they can trust uh, and give uh, to the, uh, they can give all the, uh, these archives that they protected since uh, decades and many years uh, to the national uh, archives. And this policy we don't buy, even if we are the institution uh, that an institution who can buy these uh, documents, we don't buy these elements, so we don't have to uh, deal with people and go into business and try to merchandise. So we try to convince uh, uh, people with uh, many means, and this policy has attracted in few years more than 60 uh, groups of uh, uh, documents that are pertaining to the those families and the i'm talking about digitization which is the center of this meeting the digitization is a one of the means to convince people in a first step we can say to the family uh, please we are just doing the digitizing of what you possess and if you want we will give you uh, back the documents and uh, we do the digitization of these uh, objects we give them we give it to the pe possessors and after two years uh, these uh, families does trust us and uh, they see that this institution is trustable so they give us the documents and one of the questions uh, that has been uh, it is that each family uh, has considered the institution and trust this institution so these groups are called uh, uh, the documents given are not uh, uh, put in some cases like political or uh, uh, social documents but these documents still have the name of uh, these documents. So each family gives its name to the group of objects that uh, this family is given to the institution. So we can say this family, the family from the north or family from the south, is possessing this group of elements. Uh, Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Vaida. I, I am very cognizant of the time and we are running out of time. I'm Okay, thank, thank you so much. And I, I hope this, these conversations are just the beginning of a, of a very long um, dialogue with, with all of you. Um, to, I'd like to close, uh, Professor uh, Ahmed Jafri, would you like to say some concluding remarks as, as, we, as we wind this up? I want to give you a chance to, to speak. So much. First of all, I'm Dr. Ahmed Jafri from uh, Adrar and to the African Association and responsible of uh, manuscripts uh, and this project that is uh, talking about Africa and in the world uh, since uh, the uh the starting of this website in 2018 we could invent or put the inventory and the digitization of 15,000 uh manuscripts and we had uh, hundreds of uh, uh, we have six 
uh, countries, among them Algeria, and we have a lot of uh, countries that are having uh, uh, Algerian manuscripts. You have Nigeria, United States, and other countries that possesses Algerian manuscripts. Uh, through my experience, a small experience, uh, uh, since two uh, years, I had a lot of challenges uh, that we faced and still fa uh, still facing uh, uh, some people that are working uh, in this field. Uh, uh, they uh, tell us that, uh, uh, especially in Africa, uh, especially are suffering from the lack of means. Uh, the, the manuscripts are protected uh, in uh, some places that are exposed to humidity and external uh, damages. So, so uh, these increase uh, the uh, difficulty of reading it and uh, we, can, we can lose it uh, easily. These manuscripts uh, uh, that we are losing, we could find that uh, uh, just uh, the one uh, on the others, uh, and it is not well protected. And we have challenges. The uh, researchers are facing also some challenges uh, are almost the same for everyone. Uh, and uh, for us uh, as researchers, we are uh, facing some problems uh, on having uh, the tools for the digitalization because the world is seeing a lot of progress. Uh, we have difficulties for all what is uh, technology. We are working with uh, a simple means uh, which seems uh, very uh, old. Uh, we don't have also the means for the inventory uh, in itself, um, uh, being that uh, uh, archives or manuscripts, so we can protect the manuscripts. Uh, these are almost all the uh, challenges uh, which are the same for everyone, but this is this will not stop us. Uh, we will continue our work, uh, working very hard, uh, so we can protect uh, the, uh, 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 the most uh, uh, important uh, objects and manuscripts, so we could be part of the protection of this uh, human heritage. Thank you so much. If you have any question, I'm ready. Well, thank you, Professor, and we are uh, running out of time. Um, I want to thank all of our distinguished panelists uh, for your generosity today, for your generosity of ideas, um, your interests, and obviously your compassion for the work that you're doing. Um, I think we can now conclude, and I'd like to turn to Peter Herdrick, and the co-founder of the Antiquities Coalition, who is my partner on the Digital Library of the Middle East, and director of this project. And Peter will wrap up um, this uh, remarkably enlightening and, and provocative conversation. Over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry, and thank you uh, all the panelists for your contributions today. They really are spectacular, and your work in on-the-ground situations across the region uh, is really quite remarkable. Thank you so much. So uh, what I would like to say, too, is thank you to Father Columbus Stewart and Abdel Hamid Salah for bringing your ex expertise to us and to the challenges of cultural heritage preservation as well. Now, I'm going to try to summarize briefly today's discussion, and it's not easy, but we will distribute notes to all attendees. So here are a couple of themes that I would like to identify for all of us. We want to celebrate the successes we are having in digitization, and we heard a number of inspiring examples today. Our colleagues from the Gadame uh, Manuscript Society, the Center for Manuscript Studies in Adrar, the Laboratory of Algerian Manuscripts in Africa, and the National Archives of Morocco are all providing leadership in the field. At the same time, we're able to recognize the challenges that we face in our desire to document and digitize collections. I'd like to point out a couple of those just briefly. 
I heard our experts list challenges that include capacity building, particularly in technical skills, in data management, and creating a rationalized digital environment for public access to records. I heard that equipment acquisition is a challenge and a subset of financial resources generally. I heard that conservation problems caused by dry and hot weather conditions, bugs and other pests, inadequate storage, and a lack of conservation training, those are all ongoing challenges. And Though there is more security in the region, there, is still, there are still cultural racketeers who would steal the patrimony of any nation for criminal reasons, and they must be stopped. Now, we would like to hear about your experiences directly. I'm going to ask our producer, Helena Aros, to put on our screen a polling question. There you see it, and it has a number of answers. Uh, this poll is about our cha the challenges we all face, and we're going to ask you to check the three that, in your experience, are the greatest obstacles that you face in getting their irreplaceable manuscripts and other cultural materials of the Maghreb digitized. So check three, and if you don't see the one you think is most important, check other. Unfortunately, our poll is only available in English, so I'll read the choices again, and our interpreters will let you know what they are. So number one, technical skills. Number two, data management. Number three, equipment acquisition. Number four, climate risks. Number, uh, sorry, number four, conservation issues. Number five is climate risks. Number six is cultural racketeers and other security threats. Number seven is the digital environment for records access, so digital environment. And finally, number eight is financial challenges. We'll tabulate those results and take a minute to answer those questions. And let me say in the meantime, uh, today has given us plenty to think about as we move forward with our proje project on digitization in the Maghreb. And we hope that you've learned much. Our working group will take up the challenges that we have discussed and consider ways for us to work on them together as we discuss cooperation. The goal is to develop a program that will serve the needs of this community and allow us to implement those solutions. Uh, now, we're gonna take just a second to see what we have as answers to our, uh, our uh, challenges. And I am getting chat messages which say that the top challenges are financial challenges is number, is number one. Second is data challenges, the challenges of data management, the challenges of creating an appropriate uh, data environment for materials. And then the third challenge, the highest challenge is technical skills. There you see the results. Great, thank you, Helena, for putting that up for us. Well, we will be, uh, we have these three challenges that have now been identified by you. We've heard from all our experts and we will put, they, we'll put these into, into our consideration of what to do next. They're interesting, aren't they? All these challenges were vividly described in our, in our meeting by our experts today. And as I say, they'll be a topic for further discussion and for action. And then to finish up uh, with a final question, it's about just that, it's about action. One outcome that we have set in our regional conference is to develop an initiative that will help protect the heritage of the Maghreb region. We ask that you join us in that effort. Today's discussion is a step toward understanding what you, the faithful and committed cultural heritage community in the region and worldwide would like that those responses, those actions to be and how it could best address existing needs. All this is in service to the mission we all share to protect cultural heritage via digital infrastructure and to make the unrivaled expressions of the great countries of Algeria, Libya, Mauritania, Morocco and Tunisia are close partners, accessible to interested users locally and globally. We ask you to consider that and to join us in our effort. You'll hear more from us soon on this and we'll get back to you very soon with, with some suggestions. 
So we're going to leave it with that. We thank you for your patience. We thank all our participants. We thank all our audience. I'm Peter Herdrick. Thank you for joining us here today and for your commitment to this work on the critical global issue of cultural heritage preservation. We'll see you again soon.